My name is Jörg von Sessich Liebenstein, and I will be leading this uh, um, this session where the, as you said, most in the uh, the main the main star of the event is the is the panel discussion, and we'll we'll get to that. Um, I work at Scania, and uh, my role is uh, information and analytics lead for Scania Financial Services, and um, basically my responsibility is to drive and accelerate the adoption of data-driven ways of working throughout the global uh, Scania Financial Services organization. And prior to getting into financial services, I, I was a senior data scientist within the connectivity area at Scania. And, you know, I guess you all pretty much know about Scania to some degree at least. Um, but, you know, Scania is, is so much more than, than, than just trucks and buses. Um, Scania's purpose is to drive the shift towards a sustainable uh, transport system by developing smart, safe, and energy uh, efficient transport solutions, right, that are better for people and the planet. And the interesting thing is that this puts quite high demands on our in-house capabilities where analytics uh, is a really important one. And this is one of the main reasons why this topic, right, effective in-house data analytics teams is so interesting and engaging from my perspective. And getting more into the topic then, you know, creating high performing teams is a, is a continuous challenge within any domain, really. But what specific challenges exist uh, within analytics? And are there any general principles that successful analytics teams live by, you know? Analytics teams, they, they come in many shapes and sizes. They are focusing on very different topics, business intelligence, advanced analytics, AI applications, and are organized quite differently within different types of organizations. So what is important then to, to think of when you're setting up a, an analytics, analytics team from scratch? Or are there any certain old truths about team development that doesn't really apply within the analytics space? And, and how do you scale analytic cap capabilities within a global organization? I think these are the types of questions we will discuss during this session. But thankfully, this is not only me, right? We have this wonderful panel with us today that will discuss these topics. And we first off, we have Gustav Rwondi, a senior data scientist and scrum master from Scania. Um, we have Nicole Shin, former people analytics lead for Nordea. Jakko Hagren, Head of Marketing Intelligence and Sales Analytics at Kona Cranes. And finally, but definitely not least, Dr. Eiger Rotten, Chief Data Scientist at Lieb Aerospace and Transportation. And before we're getting into the actual discussions then, um, we'll start off uh, with, with a few presentations to get, get our minds going, um, get some questions up in the air, uh, and then we'll continue down with the, with the actual uh, discussion then. And first out is Nicola will talk about people analytics. We'll continue then with Jekko, who uh, will give his perspectives on building an advanced analytics team from scratch. And Gustav also sharing his perspective on creating an awesome data analytics team. And then finally, before getting into the presentation, Igor will present himself and his experience before getting into the actual panel discussion. So let's, uh, let's kick this off, Nicole. Um, thank you for the introduction, George. Um, can you all hear me well? Yes, all good. Okay, that's really good. I'm just um, trying to share my presentation. Uh, just let me know when you can see it all. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. So... Um, um, if you can make it big screen, please. That. Uh, This is a PDF document I'm sharing. Um, yeah, if you click the view part up left on the PDF. No, no, left, left where it is written file, edit view. Edit in the view, view. view yeah. Uh, ah, full screen mode. Yeah, perfect. All right, great. So, um, so today we are going to talk about the effective in-house data um, analytics teams and I'm coming from a HR perspective. So some of the examples and things um, in, I'll put it into the people analytics context um, here and feel free to, um, um, yeah, everybody share your, your side of the story too if you have any um, interactions with HR and people analytics. 
Um, so just a little bit about me. Um, I, um, I have um, built my career in Sydney, Australia. I've worked in various financial services and telcos um, in the marketing analytics space, particularly in the um, um, marketing campaigns. Um, and over the last um, five, six years or so, I have um, transitioned into people analytics in Nordia in Denmark. So um, that's uh, where I am um, combining some of the analytic skills that I have um, built over the years. And um, yeah, just a little bit about uh, people analytics for those who may not have been exposed to it. Um, we obviously do a lot of people related reporting and headcount is one of the reportings that's quite important for us. But this is only one of the many things that the team is responsible for. Um, and also in terms of tools as well, um, there's uh, many different sizes and, and makeup of people analytics in different organizations. And everybody is using Excel as you know one of the favorite tools or preferred tools. And we do use a lot of Excel, but there's also many other tools that we use in people analytics too. Um, and in the last um, several years, as I have also been attending other conferences and reading all the other thought leaders um, uh, um, progression in how, how their area of work goes um, in terms of AI, data, HR tech is also quite exploding. And there's so much to choose from in terms of how to make the working life easier for everybody. And I think um, in, in the um, times where, when um, we have been experiencing the pa pandemic, um, many people have been working from remote and a lot of um, that was made possible because of the technology that was uh, made available for everybody to do so. So I, I actually wanted to start off with this um, little bit of um, research um, that's um, putting some kind of a business quantifiable impact um, in terms of um, the growth, profitability, and innovation. Um, uh, there's many thought leaders out there in people analytics, and Josh Burson is one of, one of them. Um, I actually chose this one um, because, uh, as I mentioned, there's many others, but uh, there, this is one of the most recent one I came across, and I thought, um, it's just perfect. I've got the latest information to share with you. So what this um, article is highlighting is the business impact of HR capabilities um, for those companies that are operating at the world-class HR skills level, uh, they are actually experiencing 4.5 times significant revenue growth than the others. And they're experiencing significantly more profit, profits, five times, 5.5 times more than the others. And they're significantly more innovative, six times more than the other um, uh, companies. So when you look at this kind of impact um, that's measured in business terms, there is a role to play for um, all organizations to develop their um, HR capabilities so that um, uh, more can be achieved at the organizational level. And just to put a little bit of a comparison, um, those who's been categorized as showing poor HR skills, they're really never the leaders in their own industry. So that's something to um, look at um, when you're um, uh, investing your time and efforts in developing the HR capabilities going forward. So what, what are the HR capabilities? Um, so basically it's, it's the part that's intersecting between HR and business and some of the panels and discussions, presentations from this morning earlier um, also talked about some of these things too. So I'm quite reassured to hear the strategic alignment um, being discussed, um, the leadership and collaboration that's been keep on coming up as well. And, and that's exactly it. It's not new, but I think um, there's a lot more to be done in this space in, in creating that strategic alignment between um, internal as well as external. And when we're talking about external um, between, um, whether it's between HR and other parts of the business or other parts of the business. And, um, you know, it could be with a, um, um, a Typically, the, the business areas, they may not often work together with. 
So um, it is at the top of mind for all the senior leaders to, you know, accelerate the adoption of digital skills. And a lot of that is done through learning and traditionally it's been done over um, classroom kind of setup or the um, online. Uh, but um, there's some examples I give later on where um, some other companies are using uh, virtual reality in creating a better, more effective learning. And that's part of the, where, where the um, new technology is coming into play. Um, and again, fostering that collaboration to um, accelerate that adoption digital skills. So it's not always about learning um, how to code SQL or how to code Python and things, things like that, but also by working together with other um, specialists and um, generalists, you get to create something that's really fit for purpose for the um, business objects and um, uh, that's quite relevant for the business at the time. Um, and one of the things I also wanted to include here is the um, workforce agility. Um, and that's about, um, and this is something I've also heard in the earlier sessions too, where um, some people note that certain skills are in short supply than others. Uh, but especially when you think about it from the organizational level, there's a lot of employees there with a lot of skill sets they may not possibly be using at the moment in their current role. So this workforce agility is uh, meant to create some kind of a framework so that it is possible for the hiring managers within the organization to be able to find the resources or skill sets or other capabilities, um, whether it's even within your own teams or um, other parts of the business. So, so that you can meet in maybe short-term needs or, you know, medium to long-term project-based needs that you can fill uh, within the business, within your own organization. And this um, uh, also includes, um, you know, the idea of the um, DEI, which is the diversity, equality and inclusion. And I think this is also important in this time where um, there's a lot more uh, variety of employee um, characteristics we need to factor in. And what I mean by that is, you know, when people talk about diversity, it's not only the gender based, it's also whether people are part time or, you know, um, working casually or working in contingency, that kind of uh, different kinds of um, employees out there as well. So these are some of the HR capabilities. There's a lot more, um, but um, I just wanted to mention some of this as a, as a start. Um, and in this section, I just wanted to um, include some of the examples, um, the kind of things that you can achieve when you work together. And of course, I'm sure a lot of um, companies do this at the moment, uh, but I do hear over and over um, uh, people, employees would like to see a lot more of this kind of collaborations happening. And perhaps as I mentioned, for those companies who are um, operating at the world-class level, perhaps they have some some kind of a secret source that allows them to be able to collaborate better than others and 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 these are some of the examples that you can achieve better if that kind of infrastructure is in place so for example you know um, I myself can wear different hats um, meaning, say, in, in the current um, space, let's say in people analytics, I may be quite um, expected to create um, uh, reporting and do analysis. But if there was another project where, for example, uh, we are rolling out a new reporting tool, new software for the first time, uh, that sort of work um, requires the collaboration with the technology team in the IT area. And in that kind of setting, I may be joining as a generalist where I'll, I may be seeking um, uh, technical um, uh, support from the um, IT area and so on. Um, and, and something as a little bit, you know, easy to, easy to do, 
I guess this is a, it's the, the labels that I've got here is not to be um, provocative, but um, you know, some are probably a little bit easier to do than others. So um, as we know, there are many analytics um, specialty tools out there as well. And, and um, not everybody can become an expert in everything, but sometimes, um, yeah, if you share some of these tools, you may be able to handle or process some projects a little bit quicker. So even sharing some of these um, uh, uh, specialty tools between the various teams within the organizations would be um, quite helpful. Um, and some of the bigger projects, um, you know, you might see out there are uh, uh, things like um, uh, um, um, a virtual reality being used in the training space. So where if your organization has many number of um, employees that you need to um, train um, and, you know, the, the perspective of the training changes over time, it's a lot more quicker for some organizations who have implemented VR are in their training um, to um, more quickly upskill the um, staff. So for instance, this one organization that were using virtual reality as um, a part of in creating the techno, um, the training was they were able to um, simulate the, the difficult customers who um, the staff might need more um, uh, practice time or some uh, some kind of a um, um, uh, uh, yeah like, like practice times to be able to better um, better handle uh, if they were in a real situation so th that kind of um, the projects need a lot of um, collaboration be between different types of um, uh, specialists and generalists generally in the organization. So um, yeah, so th these are some of the examples um, I've, um, I've got here. Um, I'm happy to hear more from others um, or even in the comments as well, um, but just um, moving on. So yeah, I just wanted to leave um, uh, some simple action items for everybody to think about when we are talking about collaboration and all of these different things. Um, it's it's um, to have that open-mindedness to think from the organization level. And um, a lot of um, us are busy, so maybe, you know, um, people are working in silos, but um, if we try to break out of the silos by doing something different, um, everybody can um, uh, realize something more than um, what they are able to do work by working in their own silos. So um, most of the time also, um, when you're working in silos, you don't actually see what some other parts of, um, of the business or uh, some other um, peers and um, you know, work colleagues might have achieved. Um, and when you have that better view, then you may not um, spend you know, the same time doing the same thing, but you can sort of build on it and you are able to progress to the next step more quickly. So um, yeah, just to keep that in mind, um, sometimes you start something now for a, a result that you may not realize, you know, a few years down the track or even if after you have left. But um, the idea is um, some of these changes need time. And, and so it's, um, yeah, it's, it's um, having that mindset to build for the future. So that's, that's where I will um, finish up my presentation for today. So something to think about and other um, uh, panelists here will um, talk more specific in terms of um, how to have a more effective um, in-house analytics teams. Perfect, thank you, Nicole. Let's, uh, I, I, let's, let's put questions in the, in the chat if you have any, we can bring those into the discussion. I think that's the best way to go forward. And uh, let's get Jaco here to share his presentation. If Nicole, you can stop sharing, please. Thanks. Yako, you are with us? Yeah. Can you all share, uh, see the screen? Perfect, yes. Great. Thank you. So, um, my topic today is uh, about how to build up a data in-house data science team from scratch. So as a background, 
for my experience, I've been working with Conecranes uh, roughly 13 years in different development roles and last five years in, in the realm of data, if I would say. And 2019, we got this uh, great opportunity with a couple of my colleagues that we, we were given the task of uh, establishing a data science lab in, in, in Lyon, France. And I'm going to share my experiences from, uh, from a year of uh, working with that project and, uh, and what I think that are the key enablers for our successful uh, establishing that uh, central resource. The basic idea was that we build a group level center of excellence for data science that supports all of our business areas uh, in solving business related problems with advanced analytics methods such as machine learning and uh, forecasting etc. So, so that's kind of the background. Uh, first of course the key point for us was that the, there was a strategic alignment and top management support to do this. So uh, we had created a digital strategy and as part of that, uh, it was aligned that data science will be kind of a key, one of the key areas uh, where we want to focus when, when, when uh, building our digital capabilities. And, and the main thought was that the data science is actually embedded in business strategies, models and operations. So, and, and what were the kind of opportunities that we saw at that point in, in a general level was that kind of a, to exploit the uh, core business and operations, we look at more efficient internal operations, better customer journey and sales, and then winning, winning at the product and service offering. So those were the main strategic teams and, and of course exploring new digital growth from supporting new business model offering uh, as well. And of course in a strategy we had to build the enablers which were of course the architecture, data, tools and other such aspects that come along with it that, uh, that we are able to actually operate this kind of a team in, in the organization. Some parts were more mature than others and, and and that was very good for us in a sense. Then a uh, second point that I, I would like to address in the very beginning when we started to establish this uh, team and we, we got uh, new recruits into the, uh, in a quite fast pace, we grew from zero to roughly 10, 11 persons in only a couple of months maybe half a year it took to get all the recruitment in place. So it was very important in the beginning to create kind of a clear goals with sense of purpose that we could communicate to the team. Since of course, you, everybody you know who have been working in a, a realm of data science that it's a, in, in practice, it's a mess in a sense. You have to <laughs> tackle different kinds of problems and relate whatever coming in related to data quality, data engineering, uh, model uh, performance uh, improvements, etc., and, and communicating all those in, in, at the same time. So keeping everybody kind of uh, on board, to, it's very important to have this high level targets that we set for the team that in, in this micromanagement world that you need to handle every day, you kind of uh, have this guiding light. So we kind of just stated these things that our kind of main purpose is to kind of develop and enable data-driven decision-making in Conecrans. It was actually just implementing these uh, machine learning models as part of business processes. That's one thing, of course. And then, then other thing to communicate broadly, our, because we need to, of course, always communicate our uh, need for our existence is that we really need to focus on generating monetary business impact. So that actually helps us to focus on the things that matter because there is such a big uh, load of different kind of requests regarding that could this be done and could that be done. So that actually gives a good guidance. And then of course, we wanted to address to everybody who joined the team that we also need to be the evangelizers 
of the of the data science in a sense everybody needs to be uh, kind of communicating how these things are working and and trying to educate everybody and of course we also created this kind of a training for uh, for increasing the uh, data mature uh, uh, data ma maturity of the understanding of the business stakeholders as well third uh, what i would like to address is that you really need to be proactive in identifying use cases and 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 that's what i mean is that the, uh, there's still a huge gap between the business stakeholders and the uh, data science professionals to kind of a finding a sweet, sweet spot of a problem that is worth of solving from the business perspective and actually feasible to solve from the technical perspective so that's that's a sweet spot you need to focus and you need to be coming up with the ideas not waiting that business would have a time and or understanding what actually is feasible to solve so and then of course uh, focus on projects that drive business and have measurable benefits is highly important so one thing was for us what is what was very good to map all the kind of uh, possibilities into a one one picture from uh, focusing on the customer so uh, going from predicting the churn customer churns or uh, analyzing uh, thousands of rows of feedback with text mining uh, then then looking at the uh, funnel analysis and lead prioritization uh, that would help uh, help our salespersons to kind of a con contact right customers and take the right leads recommend right type of uh, equipment for the end users and then of course, looking at the price optimizations, etc., uh, could we support R and D with some uh, findings, inventory optimization, etc., and 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 of course supporting the production and the procurement, finding the uh, right. We are actually. We could uh, also provi provide procurement of very rich information regarding the what how should we negotiate uh, our prices with the suppliers and and of course looking at more broader to the different support organizations from legal to uh, HR and finance and IT. So this this was kind of a, the landscape that we started looking at in the beginning and 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 not just. Uh, this helped us kind of uh, understand what are the and communicate what are the kind of uh, the multitude of opportunities that we 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 had to be solving so and then one other thing is that what was very crucial is that to, is to establish kind of our own process early on to guide the work of course and also to communicate with the stakeholders because when we start a project uh, there are certain steps in the process that will take more time and some some less and and it's an iterative manner so we 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 actually took uh, the agile grid da data mining process as our backbone and and and, and kind of a just faced it into these four phases that the problem definition phase where we actually did very very lot of work working with the business kind of we need to have the business involved in this early phase because that kind of a, is one of the crucial steps because all the time uh, we use here actually saves us from failing much more spent time on the later stages so there has been already today discussions on, on on using six months of uh, creating model that was not actually capable of solving the business problem in the end so that's kind of what we wanted to uh, highlight that and also this kind of creates that because you need really need to have to be able to uh, create successful projects you need to have the buy-in from the uh, business stakeholder he he needs to be kind of the change agent in his own organization because 
whenever we are able to create actually a model and pilot it, that, that the uh, operational change needs to be led by the business uh, owner of the idea. So that is also one thing that to uh, focus on very early on. And, and, and other steps are maybe more, more uh, familiar to you, so I'm not spending anymore on those. So, of course, piloting and operational development are, are important parts of the uh, of the process. And and this is a coming to my fifth point that uh, that when you start start pushing solutions towards production. So, what I mean that try to find projects also that are quite, kind of a easy to create uh, good enough models that you actually start uh, pushing towards the end users because then then that's kind of a the acid test of your technical environment because uh, in that process in the end you you need to I, I wouldn't I would guess that there are not many traditional companies whose technological environment would be kind of a fully ready to be running operationalized machine learning models in production. So that's very important kind of a, not to stay on the POC level too long, but try to actually build feasible solutions, even though the business case for some, some test cases are not that relevant, but that would actually prepare yourself mentally on the struggles, what it actually means, because that's a huge step from the actually just creating a model from some data to actually run it in production and, and and that's still something that we are learning so try to go towards this step early on then in the end i just uh, would like to highlight some of the things that kind of uh, we actually achieved uh, during the now roughly one and a half years of uh, uh, being an, in the in the uh, company, so there are several actually uh, things that we have already been able to create, uh, just starting from the reactive sales approaches to the proactive sales lead generation that we actually guide guide the sales persons to fix on the uh, focus on the right cases or from uh, cost plus pricing to a dynamic and value-based pricing models, et cetera. So this is kind of a landscape where we have had a success stories as well. But and this is a good step to end the presentation here. And I'm happy to answer all the questions that you have. So. All right. Thank you, Jaco. Um, yeah, think about questions. Um, that's, uh, that, that will make the discussion later on very much more interesting, I, I guess. Um, well, again, Gustav, let's uh, kick off your presentation. Or some minor issue here in the sharing. I'm not finding the share button on my screen anymore. Really. Share button. Wait a second, please. Uh. Gustav, I should see you have two accounts. So if both of them are having co-host, yes. So it is, uh, it okay. should be totally uh, down. It was, it was minimized for some reason. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Now it's sharing, right? Not yet. Not yet. So. Oh. 
So this is showing now, screen two. Still, I oh, don't. I, I need to get show also. Yeah. Now it's okay. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Now we see the presentation also. Yeah. yeah sorry about that. Um, <laughs> Uh, hi everyone, I'm happy to take part of AI Data Analytics and Insights Summit. And uh, I find this topic really close to my heart, the art of creating an awesome analytics team. I will talk around two concepts that may help you build an awesome analytics team. I will talk about why every software team needs a factory and why it's equally important to know where you are compared to know where you want to go. But first, I want to introduce myself and my awesome analytics team. My name is Gustav Rondi. I'm a Scrum Master in an analytics team at Scania. I'm a data scientist, developer, and also a DevOps enthusiast. One of my passions, apart from my work, is flying. You will actually get to see this airplane from the inside later in this presentation when I make a connection between my experience as a pilot and my work as a data scientist and developer. If you wonder what I'm doing on this picture, it's one of those situations when the reality and the plan did not match and we had to solve the unanticipated problem of an airplane all covered in snow. And here it is, my awesome analytics team. And uh, for us, it all starts with this black box that you see on the left. This box is installed in our trucks and it collects and transmits GPS positions as well as operational variables like speed, odometer, and fuel consumption. Almost all Scania vehicles are connected and as a result, we gather enormous amounts of connected vehicle data today reaching more than 60 terabytes of information. This means that we have over 600,000 connected vehicles continuously sending GPS uh, data and over 1 million vehicles uh, continuously delivering operational variables. And, and here the challenge begins for us. We, uh, our mission as a team is to leverage on this uh, global connected fleet of, uh, of the connected vehicles and uh, transform this data that we receive into uh, information, knowledge, and eventually into insights that help our business and also help our customers and external stakeholders. So what are then some questions that we can answer using this data? For example, what vehicles are suitable for electrification? How can we optimize the transport flow for this customer? Or where should we invest in charging infrastructure? When I think about an awesome analytics team, uh, the word ability comes to mind. And there are actually three variations of this word. The first variation is, is illustrated by the, the juggling man on the left. And then we have capacity, uh, which is illustrated by the middle image. And for example, by inventing flight on the airplane, we got the capability to fly. The third variation, capacity, is illustrated by the power plant outputting a certain amount of electricity in a, in a certain time frame. And, and of course, that is limited by the amount of wind. So, then, what is a good example when all these three variations of the word ability comes together? And, and to me, uh, the factory is a perfect example because in the factory we have the able workers, we have the processes, tools, machinery for producing trucks, and also capacity is relevant. How many trucks can we produce in a given time frame? So can we can we take this concept of a factory and move that into our analytics team? So is is our analytics team a factory? No, actually, I wouldn't say that, but we can enhance our analytics team and we can add capability to the team by adding factory-like processes, like 
when we're working with machine learning, we need a data pipeline that continuously outputs high quality data that we can use for training our, uh, training our models or for making predictions. And we also need a training pipeline that can reproducibly train and test and package models. And finally, we need a deployment, deployment pipeline that automates all the necessary steps for taking a package model and putting it into production and making the predictions that we are after. And this is, of course, controlled in a way by the developer. So it's an enhancement of, of the developer and the team, of course. Another example, uh, if I want to update our streaming data pipeline in, in the data lake, I make a code change uh, for the component that is pushed to Git. Uh, there is an automated process for building, testing, and publishing that component. And also an automated process for, for taking that component and, and testing it together with the other components in the data uh, pipeline. And if these tests are successful, we get a release. And if I want to, to run this uh, new version of the, the pipeline in production, I make yet another change to the pipeline specification, which is also code. So by having these automated processes, I, I have capability. So if we can make our team capable by using automation and adding factory-like processes, what about capacity? Capacity is the resulting effect from the abilities within the team, the capability of the team, and the processes and ways of working established by the team. Ability we get from the members of the team and capability we get from the factory processes and tools available to the team. Processes and ways of working is a sum of the software values and principles guiding the team towards achievements. I will continue by introducing you to a model that gives a motivation for some good practices that you, that your team may adopt. As I said, flying is one of my passions and a big hobby of mine. And I will introduce you to a concept from pilot psychology that can guide us in defining good processes and ways of working for our analytics team. As a pilot, I have the ability to fly. And the airplane is the machinery that gives me the actual capability to fly. The process of actually getting to where I want to go is a process very much connected with here and now. And in pilot psychology, this has a name, situational awareness. The picture shows an ins the instrument panel of an airplane I recently flew to the Southern Mountains. And as you can see, there are a lot of instruments. These instruments give me uh, the current attitude, the altitude, the speed, uh, the status of the engine, the next waypoint, the flight plan. And, and some of the instruments are so important that there are actually extra instruments in case the primary instruments would fail. So why then is situational awareness so important? As I said, I'm on my way to a mountain airport. And let's assume I get the clearance to land at the airport. Now I need to get to the airport safely. And in order to make the right decisions, I need to be aware of my current position. In this case, I would actually need to start to climbing in order to land uh, successfully and safely at the airport. I guess we can agree that right now is when things get done, not in the past nor in the future. What happens in the now is a result of the actions that we take. A motivation, intention, or goal drive actions. And this creates an iterative process where we take new actions based on the result of the previous actions. And there is a decision process involved here. And one way to describe it is that, it, that you choose an action based on the anticipated result of that action. And your ability to predict the result from an action is heavily constrained by your correct understanding of your current situation. And this is why situational awareness is so important for reaching our goals.
So how can we uh, take this concept of situational awareness and uh, connect that with our daily work uh, in IT and, and data science? So in order to build the right things, we need to know the needs. We need to talk to our customers and work end to end. We need to know the quality of what we build and have unit tests and integration tests. We, know, we need to know what we're working on and we need a Kanban that is updated and reflecting what we're doing. And we need to continue to deliver to production and stay connected with reality because only what we run in production we actually know is working. Also, we need to act on deviations and when something doesn't look right, we need to figure it out. We also need to know what we deploy and have version control over source code and our, also uh, our binaries. And we need to know the infrastructure that we're deploying on and maybe use infrastructure as code. Uh, some ways of working that aids our situational awareness or working in short iterations, maybe one week, week sprints, to break things down just in time and build only what we need right now. And pair program or mob program so that we have many eyes on the code that we write. So when you want to improve your analytics team, there are two things to consider. Can you improve your factory? And can you improve the ways of working in the factory? And also ask yourself, what is most unclear? your goal or your current situation and uh, that's it and i i hope this uh, inspires to some thoughts around creating an awesome analytics team all right thank you gustav very very nice very inspiring okay let's do like this then uh, igor will you just present yourself uh for shortly and then we head into the uh, to the discussion yeah, exactly. Thank you, Joe. Um, it's uh, great to be here. Thank you for your invitation. Uh, I would like to say a couple of words about myself, and then, as you said, we go in directly and we will dive in our discussion. Uh, actually, I have been involved in data science and AI some contributed time. Uh, 20 years ago, I wrote my, my PhD work uh, in artificial intelligence. And uh, it's interesting to see uh, nowadays uh, what kind of trends and velocity AI got today. In my role now as a chief data scientist in Leaper Airspace, I am responsible for building um, effective and agile data science team to create uh, communication with our stakeholder uh, leading data si science team and of course make possible for business to data driving decision drive uh, value from big and uh, small data actually exactly today it's uh, become very important topic, uh, small data and support digital transformation. And uh, just uh, four words for our discussion, I would say if I'm looking now really back and uh, on the last 20 years development of, of AI, um, I can see that a lot of uh, task or a lot of part of development are changed. AI getting new trends, of course, new to tools, new velocity, diversity, but some part of development stay like in variance. Some part are not changed and, or slightly changed. And I would say that one of them in compared with uh, mathematics and logic is also human, also people and data scientists, I would say. And uh, <clears throat> exactly as this topic stay important today as before, 
and I hope we will have now a good discussion about that, how to build data science team, how to motivate people, how, because everybody knows that behind very nice results, very motivated results, which we saw today is, uh, of course, a lot of work, a lot of try, a lot of science. Okay, I, I'd like to hand over to you, George, to lead this discussion. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Yes, okay, good. Thank you, all the panelists, for very interesting uh, presentations. And I, I would like, actually, to start in the, in the way of working space. I think that that was a kind of a, you know, an, a theme that, that was presented in all your presentations, uh, really, from, from, from some perspective, at least. And... I think maybe we can we can start a little bit where, where Gustav ended, I think, and see if do you do you others see any any friction or any any contrast of how you work in related to what Gustav presented here? You or Jaco, for example, who presented how you built an analytics team. Did you have another flavor in terms of where you're working, or is there any contrast between how you worked and how what Gustav presented? I would say that uh, there is not a contrast, but a different type of a maturity in the sense that we 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 gathered the team rather short pace in a sense and started uh, tackling multiple pro projects at the same time to uh, gain the traction. So it was kind of a quite fast paced uh, ramp up of the lab. So. Uh, I think we are currently in a phase that we start, uh, or maybe like half of, after the first year, since we, we had kind of a lot of new people coming in, we would need to, of course, give, uh, get them uh, kind of a relevant projects to work with. And then, then because that's a little bit different dynamics when, when you kind of a, get it from the scratch so that we were very busy with the colleague to kind of uh, get the relevant uh, project defined for the newcomers because they are not of course able to understand our business because it takes years of time and even me as a 13 year old in the company it's a huge global organization I find every day something new so mm -hmm. that, that's kind of a thing that that we are I, I would say that we I would like to see our team to go towards this kind of a uh, su more systematic at our way of working that you could stop actually. So that was very interesting kind of to listen and, 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 and to see. So I would say more of a, not a contrast, but we are moving towards in a sense that kind of a group dynamic working. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and that's definitely something. And of course, there are a lot, lot of things that uh, we could have we of course everybody knows the thing that you would would have done something differently if you would have had a second chance in a sense but at least we created some successful projects and and, and of course we maybe would have uh, toned down the volume a little bit that, that, and take it a little bit uh, uh, mm -hmm. easier in a sense so I, I think you brought uh, up something really agile in your presentation uh, when you said that push to production. What you, what you, I mean, there is an, a name for that approach. It, it's uh, bring the pain forward, and and I think that's that's uh, really really good. You you push for something and you find the the bottlenecks. Uh, yeah. And, and I'm thinking here also that I, I, th I think you're, you're saying something that's really interesting here, Jaco, that, you know, getting, getting the right projects or getting the right stuff to work on that both makes sense from a business perspective that, makes, that gives a lot of impact, but at the same, same time is feasible from the technology perspective and from the, from the analytics side. It, it's, not, it's not easy, right, all the time. And it, it's, it takes a, it take a lot of work. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And what would you say, Gustav, then, from your perspective, in a, since you're in a, in a bit different setting, how do you work with like, getting, getting the right things to work on, on the right projects to, to, fit, uh, to fit your team and also make impact in the business? Yeah, I mean, we have had some agenda to, to, to make an impact. And I, I guess we so kind of from the grassroots or from bottom-up perspective. But we have 
all along, I think, and I mean, we, we have been working in the same team before, and, and we have talked a lot about uh, uh, learning or teaching or motivating uh, uh, pull from, from, uh, from management and, and from customer stakeholders. So, I mean, we, we, we really have been working towards that to, to find the stakeholders within the organization that we uh, can deliver value to. And, and uh, mm -hmm. delivering value ha has been uh, uh, the key for, for our <laughs> bottom-up uh, uh, strategy. So mm -hmm. um, it's interesting that we are coming from different uh, angles uh, here, I think. Yeah, and if we let uh, Igor into the discussion, what do you say from, from your perspective and having an extensive experience within this space? Yeah, from my perspective, I would say at the beginning, it was very interesting, Gustav, to see your presentation and the presentation of data science from pilot point of view. And uh, this is exactly it's interesting because you're from Scania, right? And when I'm thinking about uh, the subject uh, that in uh, airspace industry, of course, uh, development from uh, data science is, um, it's, I would say, a little bit different than in another area because uh, uh, if you think about teams, about creation, data science models in team, then um, the value like uh, <coughs> responsibility, reliability become very important, uh, uh, very important uh, weights, very important features. And sometimes, of course, you need to, yeah, I would say, sacrifice some fancy model in order to get something sustainable, which run uh, all the time. And in this right moment, when you show in, as a pilot, when you fly, exactly the model should work and cannot uh, stay uh, the drive right on the street and stay. And uh, of course, it uh, puts the stuff in the perspective. You need to think how to build a team uh, because uh, AI changes, it means that teams should have a possibility to uh, change uh, or develop, reinform reinforce uh, them, uh, herself, I would say. It means data engineering sometimes going more in data analysis and data science and vice versa. And uh, team should be capable to support uh, uh, this uh, development. Yeah, that's interesting. And I think this relates very well to another subject that quite closely uh, goes into the way of working discussion. And, and it's something also I've heard uh, earlier on the conference being discussed. And I think that's around ownership of like the analytical assets that you develop. I, mm -hmm. Because I, I, what I hear is that some teams um, see that in order for them to be very productive, uh, and then, then they want to focus the data scientists and, and the machine learning experts to develop the models and then have some kind of other setup to, to transfer that ownership and the operation of that to another team to make sure that we can utilize those professionals in a, in a good way, right? But I, I know that there is uh, different views on this. And I think that's that from a DevOps perspective, this might clash a little bit. I'm not sure. What do you think, uh, Igor? What, how do you see from your perspective? <laughs> from my perspective, of course, operational, uh, model operational is a big uh, point and big subject in whole data science uh, development uh, lines, I would say, process. Uh, just put model in operation and forget about it. Uh, from my perspective, it's not a really right way because, yeah, so, uh, sometimes ago I heard that data science model, it's like a fish that you try all the time to catch this fish in order to deliver a reliable results. Because uh, if you just put model in an industrialization, industrialization phase and stage and forget about it, that most probably in a couple of months, you will be a little bit frustrated by result. Uh, that is why I'm thinking that data scientists uh, should care about this model, should get a feedback, uh, even if uh, another team care about industrialization and running daily business. Is there anyone in, in the panel that thinks very differently? 
I think you're on mute, Gustavo. Yeah, on mute. I, I totally agree that uh, putting a model into production, that's, uh, that's when you really start to learn uh, things, I guess. Yeah. Or, or even starting looking at data. Yeah, and, and the real real nature of the uh, of the whole profession comes out when you actually run the ML machine learning operations. So because we all know that all the model performances they degrade over time, and you need to develop and retrain and and, get inside the new bias yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and and also also monitor all the time that incoming data is it on on in in, in relevant condition now we're getting some funny results uh, what is actually the impact of the business that's one thing of course when we use something in operations we need to actually measure that is it actually moving the needle the right direction because there are possibilities to of, uh, of that of course effects are negative as well so there are a lot of, lot of things kind of a, what is not available in a sense in this kind of a data science sphere of data science literature and stuff that usually focuses mostly on the how to how to build this model and using algorithms and stuff like that but that that really is that's why of course also mentioned that uh, pushing things to production because that's where the money is in a sense that you don't model that is not in use in the business it doesn't bring any business value so any analytics is kind of a not valuable as itself it needs to drive some action in the in the organization and since we are a, a company who who, need, who is kind of a operating in its own own uh, dynamics that, that that actually we need to focus on that the Part of the development of just fancy models is kind of a, in a, in the academic side. So. Hmm. But 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 given this um, this position then that you're that you're communicating now, how should we then scale our analytic um, capabilities then? Um, how do we get this capacity if we are if we are then you know um, as as we're going we get our we get our models into operation right we have and we have to maintain them over time develop them over time. But how can we how can we scale this operation then? Does it require? Uh, there are a couple of at least ideas that we are uh, currently holding. Is that kind of and, and what what I have been referencing to others, for example, if you are talking towards that uh, challenge that that uh, when we maintain the model, it takes time. Of course, the resource of uh, data science to build data scientists to build a new ones and develop new ones. So, for example, one one good approach for this is kind of a uh, to get junior people onboarded by kind of a, okay, you take something that is already kind of a developed. You you give that to a junior uh, guy to kind of a maintain and learn learn the kind of a dynamics because at, at the same time he kind of a sees what, what actually means to do it in practice. And also, also then he learns the technological environment and he kind of learns to update that. And, and when he gets his first project, kind of then then you can then he knows actually the environment already so this is at least one strategy and of course you can build kind of a uh, split the team into data science and machine learning engineering in a sense that you have the other parties actually maintaining the models and building all that infrastructure uh, and and of course you need to have the one who who has developed the model to fix it if there are some issues but you can also uh, and one thing is that you can automate some parts of it so hmm. And, and, and looking at this, I, I'm thinking about Unicall then uh, from the, the HR and the people analytics perspective. How do you look at this uh, based on your experiences? Well, one, um, we have attempted to approach the more, you know, advanced um, teams to help um, support us process some of the recurring, more repetitive, more um, manual kind of uh, work that comes through our way. I mean, if, if for example, even, you know, Gustav and Yako, you talk about your capacities and it's almost like you have the ability to choose the projects that you want to work on. 
But um, in our case, we are also responsible doing, you know, operational reporting, mandatory reporting. So it's not something we have a choice. Um, but as the volumes increase, we look to the advanced technology machine learning to process those um, more quickly. So that's sort of our take on, mm. you know, com um, collaboration with the advanced teams. And at times um, it's been um, a long journey to get to a stage where we can actually um, uh, show value to the business. So it's still work in progress. Mm. From your experience, uh, what is most important? You gave some metrics on uh, how how important HR is. Is uh, where should you focus? Finding the right people or making people work together? Um, I guess it, it depends on the um, the work we are talking about, isn't it? Because um, as I sort of alluded to, you know, some cooperation need time to develop. So you may not see the benefit of it right away, but you have to start that process. So it becomes easier for people to realize the benefit. Um, so I think there is a, um, there is a combination of um, trying out things that will take a long time now, as well as trying to do work that will give you benefit in the short term at the same time. Very important. And, and I think getting into this perspective is also like the leadership of, um, of analytics teams. And I, I guess you are all leaders uh, from different perspectives and, and within different roles. But what do you think characterizes or what's most, the most important aspects of leadership in terms of leading analytical teams and getting them successful and, and efficient? I mean, a bit from experience. I mean, the, the, the only way I have found that that, that works is to, to show by example. Mm -hmm. Examples are important. Right. I, I mean, to, to, to actually show that you uh, can create value. Yeah. yeah. In, in actual terms, uh, then then uh, then you make impact. Yeah, yeah. I'm also, for, for, yeah, I'm also fully agree with you. But I would say, from my perspective, it's also very important to create some kind of uh, area, uh, protected area where team can develop uh, themselves, because. Uh, Usually, data science team. It's very uh, um, diversity uh, diversity team, which uh, usually has a absolutely different type uh, type of people from IT engineer till uh, <clears throat> uh, data science speaker, people who communicate results. Mm -hmm. In between is physical and mathematician, of course. And to make possible that uh, all people uh, can communicate with each other, develop themselves to open all 100% possibility, it's, I think, very important for team building. Yes, I think that, that the leadership role is exactly that, in a sense. Of course, uh, I, I would agree with the both of you, uh, kind of, uh, <laughs> that... that uh, that you need to show results, but also you need to enable the team uh, the security to do do because it's kind of a, it takes time and one one big part of that is I, I really liked in in the earlier uh, presentations that communication 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 is kind of the main tool of the leader of the team in a sense that you need to be the kind of a information provider for the stakeholder business stakeholders, but also barrier between between the kind of a, to, to ensure the uh, piece that you mentioned, Igor, for the team to actually develop these things in, in, in a manner to also communicate them, uh, because there is the, uh, at least in the 2019, still there was this kind of AI help was still well, well alive. So the expectation levels were <laughs> kind of a mile high. I, 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 I'm luckily, now 2021, the, the expectations have kind of come to a reasonable level, at least what I, I feel. So people come to acknowledge that. But that's kind of a uh, leadership position. Of course, you need to be 
understanding the how the team operates and guide from there, but also give the security, but also to communicate a lot, lot all around the organization, who are you and why you are here in a sense. I mean, we have only succeeded when we have co co collaborated with uh, markets. So, so, I mean, they are, it's a whole chain. Uh, we can definitely do everything ourselves as a team. It, it needs to be connected. Um, and uh, yeah, but uh, I mean, we, we struggled a bit in the beginning finding that pull, but eventually we found it and then it starts working. Yeah. And I also recognize very much what you're saying, Jaco, that, you know, because of this hype, because of the, the kind of communication that, that's, that's around for, for AI and machine learning, some people have very, very high expectations yeah. and maybe only some kind of see the magic of, of, of data and machine learning. But yeah. how, do you, how do you handle that from a more practical sense or how, what's, what's your experiences in that communi communication with different types of stakeholders to, to give reasonable expectation and make them understand what this data and AI really about? Yeah, you need to gradually educate others. It's, it's kind of a long-term long pro process, of course, because usually those are high-paced pay individuals who are on a high-level management positions, and you need to kind of get the time and patience for them to kind of, because this is, it seems easy, but it's very complex things that we are talking about, and, and there are a lot of details that can go wrong, and etc. This kind of a in, in, iterative interaction with the stakeholders is, crucial to get them into, into play in that what, what it actually means in practice to build AI or machine learning. Mm -hmm. So that, that's at least one, 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 way to, one way to put it. I don't know how well we have succeeded in that, but, but at least we have a couple. Of, and of course, over time it grows because the, the ones who have been involving with the team come up now with much better ideas. And of course, we've, we've had this kind of a group level training sessions as well. And we are actually running a program at the moment internally to educate also the stakeholders to understand the technical feasibilities, at least on some level. And there was actually one this good uh, general uh, program on AI in, uh, established in Finland that quite a few people took in the, uh, from Helsinki University that actually was done by several people in the, in the whole country. So yeah. those kind of things kind of help, help to put the bar high enough in a sense. Or... Uh, what do you think about that, Nicole? Yeah. Uh, training. Um, well, maybe that's something, um, you know, your, you can speak to your learning teams and see how to create communication um, video that will mm. translate the complexity behind the kind of work you do and the, the benefit the organization will have at the end of it. And maybe build in some sort of a um, realistic timeline so you're managing those people's expectation and when they can actually see something that's more tangible. Yeah, I, I think there was one, one good point in the earlier presentations as well that you need to bring up the complexity in a certain level, not to confuse the stakeholders, but to understand that this is kind of a, not what the AI consultants are kind of a promising in all around the club that that or some marketing materials that say that okay bring your data and we will just give you results mm -hmm. uh, i mean uh, abstractions are really important uh, and, and helps us understand things but it's easy to mix up the abstraction with reality and get stuck in it so you yeah. end up in some boxes on the powerpoint yeah. yeah and also one thing what was very interesting to knowledge that that the, the questions that came at the beginning were, they were kind of a ranging from easy to impossible. And that was kind of, it was very kind of a, uh, or not ranging, but it was kind of a bipolar in a sense that either we, they, uh, the first questions were kind of a just simple, uh, build a queries to a database. And then, then we, when we are achieving something, then the questions start like, hey, for example, uh, but we all know that it's very hard to kind of interpret why the results are like this. Hmm. So if you create a prediction model and then the questions are, I, I don't care about that, but 
tell me how it affects if we change the prices, for example. How does it affect the probability of the cases? And everybody who has uh, worked with the machine learning knows that that's kind of an unsolved problem of the whole. And how to explain that? That actually that because the, when you intrigue them, then then the questions come way too hard to answer. Mm -hmm. That's the finding the sweet spot to kind of simplify the business problem enough that it's answerable with the current current methods because and that, yeah. that's, that, that's yeah, very I, yeah, I also think that it's important stuff to pay attention on explainable AI and uh, to pay attention on storytelling that uh, you bring your example but this example can be this tangible example can be supported by reality, not really by a, a PDF presentation, but by running example, running results. And uh, it's a, I would say it's a little bit tricky, of course, to connect uh, data crunching part and storytelling part for the same process of the same model. Hmm. Right. We have a question from the crowd here. Uh, so it's from, from Maya Kovista from Ramble. To you, Jaco, um, about if the course that you're talking about, if it's the elements of AI. Yes. Yeah. And I think that we can spin further a bit on the, on the educational uh, perspective here. How, do, do you have any, any other tips and tricks if you want to drive um, the awareness and learnings within within your respective organization in terms of AI or data science in general. I really like the Gustav's uh, point that practical examples, how, mm. what does it mean to us in a sense, mm. what you can build, that's the best communication ever <laughs> always yeah. is that do something that solves something in your organization and that's kind of your first, first communicate the, the material that what actually machine learning means. Yeah. For us it means this, we can do that. Yeah, ex exactly. And that, that's my experience also. That's like the, the most powerful communication is, is communicating something that you have done very practically and you can... Yeah. You, you, in you your can organization. Exactly, and you can communicate the learnings. We, we yeah. did this, we learned this, so the next time we will do it in this way instead. And it that becomes a lot, a lot of questions from others. Hey, we want that kind of a thing. We have this kind of a problem as well, so. Mm -hmm. And you also can explain results which you yes. get. Yeah. Yeah. It means to go out from black box to, I would say, white box. Yeah, yeah and that actually tracks attention much better because everybody knows what our business's problems are. And if you solve one of them, even if a small one, then, then everybody comprehend, hmm. at least the ones who are with the company for a while. So. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, also yeah. this uh, communicate, communicate, communicate. I yeah, think yeah, that's, that's the thing. Com yeah. Communicated a lot about our capabilities around your spatial information. Uh, just something simple as we are detecting stops when, when uh, vehicles stand still and uh, calculating the duration and, and just making people understand the difference of the position of the stop has been yeah. uh, a struggle. And I have to admit that uh, at least personally, it, it's so easy to kind of just because you're attracted to solving problems yourself. It's easy to get kind of a from problem to a problem and, and after solving it, just kind of leave it. But, but the, the, you really would need to focus on that. Hey, communicate that you solve this problem to others as well. Hmm. Because it's, it's actually more, might be even more valuable than pro solving the problem for the stakeholder. Of course, that as well. But that kind of a, can gain much more towards your team than solving the initial problem. So, but it's, I think we are natural problem solvers, all of who are in the field. It's so intriguing to just jump to the next one. So. Yeah, exactly. I would say that it's important to understand that this process really takes time, not only to get tangible uh, results, but also this whole education process. Mm -hmm. that you show your results and this sustainable results. It's not only results for next month. You can give kind of guarantee for repeatable, for sustainable process. And in order to get some uh, 
um, acknowledgement, some trust. Yeah, exactly. I, and I think I think that's the last thing you said here about trust is, is really important from from a lot of perspectives. Actually, when we talk about data and 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 analytics in general, right? Both trust in the data, but also trust in the result that your analytical projects generate or the models, right? But but how do we how do we ensure how do we get that trust in both data and the the analytical results? Yeah, I would say this is the best way with sustainable results mm. that you can repeatably to demonstrate accuracy of your model of your action and of course with the communication hmm. in order to explain how, how did you get that that it's not like a magic but it's really a reliable process hmm. do you have any empathy here nikolf coming from your perspective in the in the hr space and in, in this regarding trust and, and how we can get trust in our, both our uh, results, but also the data. Yeah, I, I think as you um, sort of talked about, it is a complex uh, topic. So to get it across to the business, perhaps even you know, just bite-sized, um, you do like brown bag lunch sessions kind of things. Um, uh, you might actually get a lot more interest from the Nicole, it seems there is some technical um, problem with your well. internet. So, of the business and after that. Yeah, it's shopping up a little bit. We, we can't hear you properly. Um, but, but time is running yeah, right, very, very, very fast. Uh, it's a, it's a bit shaky. You're breaking up, actually. But is there any one of you who want to put down a final remark now on our discussion and, and and tie this together a little bit? I think this about trust is really important that you can't expect uh, to have trust uh, in the beginning. You have to, to prove yourself. You have to prove your data. That's really how it is. I think. And prove the results. That's actually ra rather hard not to crack also because that actually brings the results that yeah. that what is the if it, i know that this it's a big question to ask to actually show the impact of your activities because this is but that of course creates the trust if 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 the needed uh, goals are achieved then people are not too um, and of course you need to be applying to all the standards but Technically, but usually business stakeholders seem to lose interest of the why we did it if we can kind of uh, bring the needle up. So, right, yes, okay. And black box is not the problem if it brings money. So, if it's done, <laughs> done properly and with the, all the kind of uh, legally uh, stated things are. You know, <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah, perfect. Thank you, Echo. Okay, good. I think we wrapped the, the panel discussion up by, by your final remarks. And I want to thank you very much for this very interesting discussions and, and presentations. And thank you for, for the audience, audience for listening in. And if you want to get hold of us, I guess most of us are available on LinkedIn. If you yes. want to discuss these topics more, I think all of us would enjoy that. So just uh, just connect with us and uh, yeah, thank you everyone and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you so uh, much. Please switch you. off your camera and mics. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, just all of before your presentation, I would like to thank the panelists again and just 